Assalamu alaikum. You are listening to the Buried Treasures Podcast Season 2. Welcome back. We have a great lineup of guests coming on for this season. Join us every Thursday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time on youtube.com backslash Masjid Uthman. Audio recordings are available on Mondays on all of your favorite podcast platforms. As you know, Masjid Uthman is under construction. Please consider making a contribution to building a masjid via the link in the description below. Cue the intro. Welcome to the Buried Treasures Podcast, brought to you by Masjid Uthman, where I interview a new guest every week to discover their journey. I'm Hamza Warsi. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakumullah khairan for everyone for joining us for the second installment of uh, the biggest and best Bulls fan ever. He is now team iPhone as well. MashaAllah, Mana Shama, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, 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 doing well. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Tell us, tell us more about the Rams. <laughs> There's not much to say there, man. <laughs> nice, MashaAllah. Uh, so, Mona, we we left off. I wanted to backtrack a little bit about where we left off. You left off during or ta- speaking about the interview itself um, for yeah. for the madrasa. Um, you mentioned prior to that mm-hmm. you went for Umrah with your right, right. teacher. Right. Um, I had a very particular question in regards to that. How much Quran were you able to recite to him during that trip? Um, so. Uh, um, in that in that particular trip, I had just finished memorizing the Quran before that, and um, uh, that particular trip, myself and my Ustad Mu'an Harun, we both went together uh, for Umrah, and um, in that trip, we weren't too focused on reciting Quran to one another. Mm-hmm. As much as we were just focused on reciting as much Quran as possible, mm-hmm. because when if I were listening to him, I wouldn't be able to recite, and if he were listening to me, he wouldn't be able to recite either. Yeah. So we both just decided that we would try to recite as much Quran as possible. So our goal was to recite one Quran every single day. Mashallah. Um, that's what we tried doing, and Mashallah, he was he he was really good with that, and and um, I, he wouldn't want me to say anything, but. You know, you can kind of connect the pieces to the, to the puzzle. Um, myself, you know, I tried my best, but sometimes it would be like maybe two days or I would split it over three days. But I was trying to also recite as, just as much Quran as possible throughout the entire day. So we would uh, wake up for for suhoor tahajjud. We would, we would already be awake. We would have our suhoor prayer, fajr salah, recite some Quran. And then around ishraq time, we'd go back to the hotel and, and rest mm-hmm. right before dhuhr. Then dhuhr time, come back. Pray Dhuhr, and depending on how tired we were, maybe rest one more time after Dhuhr, from Dhuhr to Asr. And then you're up from Asr all the way basically till, till Fajr. Oh, mashallah. Um, and we would just try to recite as much Quran as possible. In Medina, That we were, we were in Medina first for the first 15 days we were in Medina. And then the last 15 days we were in Mecca. Mm-hmm. And um, that was a little bit more difficult because in Mecca you have Umrah and mm-hmm. Tawaf. And in tawaf, you know, it becomes difficult to to recite the Quran. Um, myself, I was looking for the Mus'haf at times recite, reciting without looking for the Mus'haf. But it was just difficult for me to to keep focus on that. And I felt like in tawaf, it was more important for me to do dua at the time. Mm-hmm. That's just what my sentiment was. And I, I kind of went with that. So in Mecca, I was reciting, not maybe on a daily basis. Like I wasn't finishing the Quran daily, but maybe every third day or so. Okay. And I also did uh, Irtikaf in, um, in the Haram as well, uh, in, in, in Mecca, the last 10 days. And that was really something. Uh, it was it was completely different experience, something that I, I hadn't experienced up until then. I did Irtikaf in my local masjid, Darul Islam in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm-hmm. Um, I did it twice. And then after that, I did it in, in in the haram, and I think I did it one more time after that. But then after that, I've, I really haven't been able to do etikaf like that, like ten days, where I've just stayed in the masjid because I was either it was I was on break in Ramadan, and you know you're just trying to spend as much time with family as possible. Mm-hmm. And and now you know with taraweeh, you have to go to different masajid. 
-hmm. And before I had the responsibility of Taraweeh, I was just a student memorizing Quran. So I didn't have to go lead in a masjid. But now you have to leave the masjid in order to lead Taraweeh, unless you do Irtikaf in the masjid, which you are doing Taraweeh, which is which can sometimes be difficult, you know, for, for her father, especially they know that if you're in a different, uh, you, you, you live in, for example, Chicago, and you have to drive 30 minutes every day to pray in like a small musallah or something like that. There's no way that you could do Irtikaf mm -hmm. uh, unless you stay in the actual musallah itself. So that's kind of what happened with me. But the last time, like I vividly remember doing Irtikaf was in Mecca. MashaAllah, that's amazing. Um, you've been leading now Salat Taraweeh for uh, probably what, 13, 14 years now? Uh, I would like to say so. So I finished memorizing the Quran in 2010, January 8th, 2010. Um, that year when we went for Umrah, I didn't lead Taraweeh that year. Okay. I was just reciting Quran. But every year after that, I I led Taraweeh unless there was a basketball injury prior to that Ramadan. <laughs> so there, I had, um, I sustained, a, uh, and it's not like, you know, like yeah. uh, NBA level or something. It was just pick up games with my friends. I remember very uh, vividly this one time I was playing one-on-one -on -one with, with one of my friends in St. Louis. And this was the night before my sister's wedding. And at that time, I was really trying to lose weight. I had mm -hmm. gained a lot of weight, and I was like, yeah, I want to start exercising. That's when I really got into exercising and wanting to care about, like, my health and my well-being, and especially me uh, going to the doctor and the doctor telling me, you know, you really need to get this under control. Otherwise, this could be problematic for you in the future. So I started exercising a lot. And any opportunity that I had to get some cardio, I was always looking for that. And so we, my, my sister... Uh, her wedding was the very next day, the wedding reception. The nikah was already done. So the very next day we were supposed to have an event. And I remember that night I had already worked out, but I had like a little bit of Chinese food. So, you know, the MSG and everything. And I was like, man, you know, <laughs> I just wasted my workout and everything. And then my friends were like, yo, we're playing basketball at the masjid. It was Friday night. Why don't you come play? And then I was like, I'm going to go play basketball. And she's like, no, don't go play because you're going to end up hurting yourself. Something's going to happen. I'm telling you. I'm like, no, 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 I'll be fine. She's like, you don't listen to me. I was like, no, 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 it's, all, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to go play. And I went and we had finished everything. Like we, we finished playing. No incident. Nothing happened. And at the end, my friend was like, yo, you know, I, I told one of my friends, I was like, yo, let's just play one-on-one -on -one a little bit. And we're like, all right, yeah, let's play one-on-one. -on -one. And I remember we were playing and it was like first to seven or something like that. We were just messing around. Yeah. And so he he was winning and I was like, okay, you know, I got to turn it up a little bit. And in turning it up, I ended up rolling my ankle and I rolled it really badly, oh, like man. really badly. I hadn't felt that type of pain. I've sprained my ankles before playing football as a kid, but that kind of pain, I never rolled my ankle in that fashion. No. So, And this was like two weeks prior to Ramadan as well. Oh, wow. I was just back from Madrasa or maybe a week prior to Ramadan. I want to say this was like probably 2012, I think. Mm -hmm. It was 2012. Can't really remember. But I ended up rolling my ankle, spraining it really badly. I thought I tore something or I broke something. And I ended up going to the ER and they did an x-ray and all that good stuff. And they're like, okay, you know, you just have a really bad sprain. You need to stay off this thing for some time. And I couldn't even stand and pray. Oh, no way. And then I go home and I'm in crutches. And then my sister's like, what did you do? And I'm just <laughs> sitting there in bed and I'm just like, you know, I messed up my ankle. And she looks at my ankle and she's like, I told you not to go out. And she's mad at me at the same time. She's feeling sorry because it's like all bruised and like yeah, yeah. nasty looking. And... I remember that I was on crutches the very next day. Everyone was like, what just happened? Yesterday you were perfectly fine <laughs> and you're supposed to be giving the speech at your sister's wedding and here you are in crutches, you know, like <laughs> what's going on? And um, I, because of that, I wasn't able to lead Trawi that year. Mm. So that was like the first year where I, true, I really missed Trawi. And so I missed that year. And then every year after that, I led. Mashallah. Every year after that, I led up until now. So all the way up until this, this year, I did Trawi where I tore my ACL in the gym and then I had to have surgery on the 7th of April. I had surgery on the 7th of April and then Ramadan started like, I think a week later. And so I wasn't able to stand and I wasn't able to lead Taraweeh this year. And actually the year before that, I led Taraweeh at home for the first time in front of my parents Mashallah. in quarantine. Yeah. When the massages were, a lot of them were closed, majority of them were closed. I was able to recite the entire Quran in front of my parents. Mashallah. And that was, alhamdulillah, one of my lifelong dreams was to to do that for them. 
And my dad stood with me the entire time, my mom, and they both prayed the entire, uh, you know, 29 days that we that we fasted. Um, and I did the entire Quran with them. And that was really that was really amazing. It was special for me. Mashallah, mashallah. You got to stay off the court, bro. Yeah. At least yeah, in man. St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it seems like. Mashallah. May Allah yeah. Ta'ala protect you, man. Amen, amen. That's rough. That's rough. Um, going back to uh, your <clears throat> Alamiya course, you were mentioning about the interview process itself. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of rounded up, uh, I think, uh, along the lines of you, how bad your Urdu was. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. So, you know, like after the interview process, you got into both schools. Uh, you had this decision to make. Right. And, right. you know, what made you lean towards uh, Hassanin? Right. I um, I don't know if I mentioned in the last part or I probably I might have alluded to it. But the main deciding factor was it was just my parents um, and them feeling oh, yeah, safe yeah. where I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom wasn't really in favor of me being in Karachi at the time where Ibn Abbas was mm -hmm. because back then in 2010, things were really, really bad. Um, there were regular muggings that were happening every single day. Um, <clears throat> just so much crime that was happening there. People were being robbed at gunpoint, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And then the Punjab area was a little bit more safer and well, a lot more safe, actually. And it was only five hours away from uh where my parents are from Miyawali, our hometown and um, you know my grandma may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her I mean. who passed away um she she was there and so my mom felt comfortable with me being close to there only five hours away from there versus being an entire day away well, karachi was very far away from where we were yeah and my mom was like you know i would feel safer if you were there Mm -hmm. um, and so then I just did a stikhar and ultimately I decided that I'm going to go with whatever makes my parents happy. If my parents are happy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be happy. And that was basically my driving force. Mashallah, mashallah. How was it um, kind of going in day one? Like what what was the differences in luxuries that you had in America versus Pakistan? It, so it, was, it was very different, but at the same time, it wasn't too foreign either because mm -hmm. uh my parents uh may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and, and I mean, give them a healthy life they I mean. always took us back uh to to pakistan um to for us to really be in touch with with our roots mm -hmm. um and for us to kind of just see what life is there is like so that we can really appreciate the luxuries that we have here mm -hmm. So we would generally go during our summer break and spend time there. And just the small everyday things that we take for granted. Clean water. Yeah. One of the most basic needs that we have. Over there, you can't drink uh, water from the tap. Over here, we don't drink water from the tap that much either anymore. But like just the clean water uh, that you have, you have to boil the water. It's not easy to get uh, clean drinking water over there. Electricity. Mm -hmm. Something that we rely upon. We don't even think too much of of losing power. Uh, whereas over there, you go hours on end without power. So just those basic small things. So I kind of had an idea of how things were, but not for an extended period of time, more than a month or two months. That was what was difficult for me to wrap my mind around mm. was that I'm here for an extended period of time. Back then as kids, whenever we would go, it was always, okay, I'm just here for a month and then I'm going to go back home. Yeah. Uh, but when I was there in Madrasa studying, it was like, I'm here for the next 10 months mm -hmm. and I don't go back until the end of that time. So that was the di most difficult part, wrapping my mind around that. And it just becomes very taxing after some time because you really just want the basic necessities like... I'm an individual that enjoys taking hot showers year round. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in, in Pakistan, you have extremely cold water in the, in the summer. Um, and I kind of learned to appreciate that later. But even then, there were times where I wanted to take a hot shower, but there's just no hot water available. And in the winter, how they would have those water heaters. And if you don't go during a set time, all of the warm water will be used up. Mm -hmm. You have like an hour max to go before fajr salah yeah 
uh, you really need to get up early if you want to shower with warm water mm -hmm. or hot water. Because if you get up around Fudger time, like 30 minutes before Fudger time, there's going to be a long line of students, one. And then two, it's all going to be cold water. So I just remember having to take really cold showers in the winter. And like you step outside and it's not closed off. It's open air. Yeah. And you step out and you're just freezing and you're shivering. And there's like smoke coming off your body because of how <laughs> cold you are. And it, it, it was definitely a learning curve. So I was, to say the least. Okay. Uh, and walking in your first year did you do you didn't do any prior studies in arabic right no i hadn't i hadn't really studied anything before formally but i did study a little bit with mufti minhaj mm -hmm. uh, in, in st louis we studied lisan al quran which Mashallah. is a book that is uh, written uh, by some of the teachers at ibn abbas mm -hmm. my mother said that i initially planned on going to um, so i covered a few lessons of that with mufti minhaj but nothing more than that nothing beyond that um, I had also just memorized the Quran with word to word translation. Um, th that's what helped me memorize quicker. Mm -hmm. It was looking at the translation first. Mm -hmm. I would look at the word for word translation. My mother, she printed out the word for word translation from the internet. And I would look at the word for word translation, read the translation first, and then memorize my sabbath. Once Shana. I have like I have an understanding of what's going on, it would be easier for me to visualize it and piece it together. So I knew just very basic words. Like I was able to recognize certain words if they were similar to the words that I'd seen in the Quran. Mm -hmm. So for example, um for example you have and, and little thanks do they give so yashkurun I was able to recognize the word yashkurun like they give thanks mm -hmm. or they, they are giving thanks or they will give thanks I was able to recognize that but if you were to say something like ashkuru or yashkuru mm -hmm. which is from the same root word I wouldn't be able to recognize that because that's not the same exact word that was used in the Quran mm -hmm. so it's not like I had studied anything that would have really helped me too much yeah. it's just I was just familiar with the with the Arabic language like my level of Arabic is probably uh, the same level of Arabic that somebody in an Islamic middle school has done it's probably on that it was probably on that level mm -hmm. um, a very basic you know entry level kind of thing Ashanda. and then when I came into first year um that it, it, i i thought i would be better equipped because of that mm -hmm. but it's just it's so different from from anything that i ever learned before that it would it, it um it was difficult to kind of adapt to that and mm -hmm. it was definitely um i say more challenging than anything i think i had ever ever tried studying uh before in my life okay mashallah yeah and going through that first year of curriculum, and a lot of it is just grammar and Arabic, and there's not too much fiqh involved. Yeah, um, and usually when people jump into an Ademiyah course, they're kind of excited. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're going to tackle, you know, we're going to solve interest in America or something like that, yeah. you know? Um, but when you went into it, you're studying Arabic, was that kind of like disheartening or anything like that? Or was it just, no, I know I need to do this, and then I'm going to move forward uh, to more... Uh, in depth and detailed subjects, I think I took it one step at a time. Okay. So I knew that in order for me to understand fiqh, in order for me to understand tafsir, you know, explanation of the Quran, hadith, any of these other sciences, I first need to really grasp the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that, if I can grasp the Arabic language, then all of these other doors of knowledge will open themselves up for me. Mm -hmm. So I just focused on, okay, here's the time that I have. And this is what our teachers, they instilled within us as well, that this first year of yours, because the Hasidin curriculum is, is a lot different than a lot of other madaris. Other madaris will also have, other institutes will also have some tafsir in there, uh, maybe translation of the 30th juz. Um, they'll have a little bit of aqid in there, a little bit of you know Islamic creed. You, you'll cover that a little bit to a degree. But over there, the focus is focus on Arabic, study it really well, and give it 100% in your first year. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to master in this first year. And then the second year, this other aspect of Arabic, for example, sarf, mm -hmm. morphology. And then with that, you add a little bit of fiqh. And then you go into your third year, and then you cover nahu, 
which yeah. is grammar, the grammar of the Arabic language. You go over that, focus on grammar, take it one subject at a time, one element of the Arabic language, master it. And then add to that a little bit of tafsir as well, a little mm -hmm. bit more fiqh. And then for, by fourth year, then that's when all of the other books start coming in. You have your usul al-fiqh, you have your uh, more in-depth tafsir, you have usul al-hadith, you'll have hidayah come in more like in-depth fiqh books. So bit by bit, they were giving us a little bit more. Yeah. And the focus was always, look, don't look too far ahead. You'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah. You'll get there. Inshallah. You just need to wait. Right now, even though this may seem tedious, like, هَذَا سُكَّرٌ هَذَا كِتَابٌ This is sugar. This is a book. And you're sitting there like, how is this going to help me understand what's in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or how am I supposed to be able to benefit my community yeah. if when I go back to them, the only thing I know is هَذَا زَيْدٌ جَاءَ أَمْرٌ وَذَهَبَ بَكْرٌ If that's all I know, <laughs> then how am I going to be able to benefit my community? Because they're coming to me and they're asking me questions about finance. They're asking me questions about nikah. They're asking me questions about talaq. Mm -hmm. Now, nowhere have I studied those things yet. And that can sometimes be a little bit disheartening for students. And that's something that I always tell my students as well, that don't think that you haven't um, achieved your goal just because you're not able to answer certain questions in the preliminary stages of this course. Mm -hmm. Focus on the task at hand. You'll get there when you need to get there, inshallah. You'll inshallah. cross that bridge when you get there. Inshallah, inshallah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you guys had, um, you mentioned 10 months you guys had of coursework? Yeah, it was almost 10 months. So we would we would start almost right after Ramadan. <sighs> we would start almost right after Ramadan. Mm -hmm. So we would have like maybe a week and a half, two weeks off after Ramadan, aid with our families. And then we would come back to, to the madrasa. And we would be there all the way up until like a month and a half prior to Ramadan. And then we would go out for 40 days in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, in Tabligh. And then after that, we would then go home for Ramadan. So 10 months, basically. Okay, mashallah. Yeah, 10 months. And then that, that for, I, I want to focus a little bit on the first year. Um, when you're in the madrasa, like how is the, the living situation, the food situation? Um, is, you know, is there some adjusting that needed to be done? or yeah. everybody you, Everybody has a different story depending on mm -hmm. where they're from. Meaning what mother, whichever mother said they studied from. Um, you talk to somebody like Sheikh Hamza Makbul, and he'll tell you like crazy stories of how in Lahore they had um, some dal. He used to tell me some stories himself, like dal that you could, it, it was like water. You know, so, there was just some like yellow color in there or something like that. And you could describe it better. Healthy. But yeah, <laughs> after having something like that, you know, you just, you're having, you know, your, your bowels are just all over the place for the next few days. Yeah. Um, there's that. And then there was kind of what we had, which was, I would say the higher end. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that um, was because Mu'attar Jamil Saab, his belief was that in order for students to really focus and study well, they need to be able to eat well. Mm -hmm. And we need to make it seem as if they're as home as possible. Mm -hmm. And the way that we do that is we give them meals that are prepared in a manner that seem home cooked. Mashallah. So he really went out of his way from when I was there. Like mm -hmm. if you talk about like Mullah Bilal Ali Ansari's time when he was there initially <laughs> in the initial stages, then I'm sure it might have been different. But when I went there, it was 2010 onwards. From that point onwards, um, I actually, the stories that I had heard from from my teachers and from the ulama over here was very different from what I saw over there mm. because there were good meals right? Food that was actually tasty. You know, we didn't have like cockroaches in our food and like <laughs> insects crawling out of the rice and stuff like that. And we didn't see any of that. We would have like chicken two to three times a week, oh, um, sure. sometimes even beef, you know? And I remember one time, um, Muatar Jamil Saab himself, uh, I wasn't there at the time. I think it was either bef before I got there, I believe. But it's it's a very famous story in the legacy that is Hassanain, that Mossab one time he entered the kitchen where they were making chai. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to see what kind of chai the students were drinking. 
and he took a drink of the chai and then he puts it down and he says, what is this? Like, the students are drinking this? And they said, yes, you know, the students are drinking this. He's like, no, this isn't good enough. You need to add more milk. Mashallah. You need to add more milk. Make it the way that you would make it at home. Mm. I, it needs to be in a way that anyone who comes, they'll. it's, it's as if you're drinking chai from home. Mm. Don't, you know, <clears throat> short these students on the milk. This yeah. would add milk to it. Don't make it like all water and putty, you know, like in that, <laughs> put some milk in there. And the chai, I remember when I was there, it was phenomenal. It was like the best chai. The students loved the chai. Mm. It was so good. And anyone who tells you stories about like Raiwan, they always tell you Raiwan chai is amazing because of the milk that they put in there. They don't skimp on the milk. Yeah. Whereas uh, generally speaking, the less milk you put in there, the more money you can make off of it and, and the cheaper it is to make it. But Mossop said, it doesn't matter about that. I want to make sure that these guys, they have good food so that way they can study hard. So that was alhamdulillah one of one of the blessings uh, that one of the many blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us as students over there in Hassanain that we didn't really have too much of a problem and the students they they enjoyed um, eating food there and uh, you know even for breakfast for breakfast the first couple of years I was there we would just have chai and cake rusks mm -hmm. but then they in in the third year or fourth year that I was there they started having like uh, chane and, and like halwa sometimes yeah, with roti sure. and like a full on breakfast in the morning so that way we had three meals from the madrasa uh, and it, it was decent food and of course you had your like veggies and stuff in there too but it was all cooked well and it was it was it was uh, pretty good and some of the other madaris that we had we had seen it was it was a little bit different because obviously the overhead there is so much more you have more students and uh, maybe they don't have as much funds or maybe they don't feel like it's necessary to allocate funds to that particular purpose, you know, whatever. But that's something that Mohasab himself believed in because as a student in Raiwand, he tells stories of how for six months they only had one particular dish. It was oh, like wow. one vegetable for six months wow. that was uh, specific to that season. And mm -hmm. then the next six months, it was just one vegetable for the next six months. Oh, wow. So the entire year... You just have two things. It's like you're eating one half of the year, you're, you're eating green peppers. Second half of the year, you're eating like onions. So That's what it was for them. He said that six months of the year, this is what we were eating. Six months of the year, this is what we were eating. He's like, I remember how difficult it was. And for him, coming from the background that he was from, from a wealthy, established family, so he said for him, it was very difficult. He's like, I don't know if anybody could do that nowadays is that sacrifice even necessary nowadays mm. like instead of making that the sacrifice where students get sick and they're on their beds and they can't study because of some indigestion why not just give them good food that's cooked well so that they can sit in the masjid and they can study for a longer period of time so that was his belief and even till today in in the madrasa if you go there and you see the food is still prepared very well mashallah 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 jazakallah khairan for sharing that so when you were finishing off your first year, going back to America, right, and then coming back, was that difficult? Um, difficult in like in what regard? Difficult in the sense where you come back home, you come to St. Louis, and you know the comforts and luxuries of being home. You've been separated from your family for so long, yeah. from friends, from the yeah, community. Yeah. Um, did you? Was it easy going back? You were just like, no, no brainer. I have to continue studying. Or was it a little bit more difficult going back to Madrasa? Uh, going back to Madrasa. So I remember when I went back to St. Louis that very first uh, summer. Uh, it was 2011 when I went back. Mm -hmm. And I remember going, I, I get home. I land in Chicago. Mashallah. And yeah. <laughs> so I land in Chicago and I'm transiting there. You know, and I go through customs and they give me the whole workaround, you know, like, <clears throat> what do you do? And what were you doing there for this period of time? I told them I was studying. I was straightforward with them. I didn't have anything to hide, right? I was like, you know, you guys are just doing your job and, and whatnot. So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it was just, it was very brief. And then they're like, okay, you know, you got your connecting flight. You're good to go. My connecting flight to St. Louis, just like a 30 minute plane ride, 45 minute plane ride really quick. I'm there. And I remember the first time there was some confusion. My dad actually wasn't there at the airport to pick me up because he had one of my friends called and said, oh, you know, they wanted they wanted to pick me up. And then so instead he came and he picked me up and then he went and he dropped me off at home. And um, 
it was actually my friend that I was supposed to go and uh, study in Ibn Abbas with, uh, half of them were uh, Mahun's younger brother. Inshallah. So he came and he picked me up. He was really excited to see me and he picked me up and he dropped me off at home. And I remember going home, I'm meeting my parents after like 10 months. I'd never been away from them for that long. Mm -hmm. Like if we had gone to Pakistan before my mom was with us or my dad was with us, somebody was with us Yeah, right? at all times. So for that long a period of time, I had not been away from them for school, nothing. And I remember coming home and, and giving them a hug, saying salam to them and everything. And then I went straight upstairs to my room and I just sat down and I just kind of look out the window. And I was just like kind of just taking it all in. And mm. I just sat down and I just thought to myself, I was like, man, we truly are blessed here in America and we just don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Like it just, and, and it hit me right then and there. And I was just sitting there in an air conditioned room. I don't have to worry about when is the power going to go out. Yeah. In Pakistan, one of the very first sentences that I learned in the Arabic language was in Qata'at al kahraba that the power went out. The reason why I learned that sentence first was because it happened so often over there. Yeah. So you just add, and that's kind of what we did in Madrasa, like, yeah, how do you say this? And then they would tell us, okay, this is how you say it. So I would say, like, the power went out. And then somebody would tell me. And because that was one of the first things that happened. Mm. Well, I get there and it's like the power is out every hour or sometimes two, three, four hours. And mm -hmm. we're, this is a festival we're talking about. One of the major cities in Pakistan. And if this is the case there, imagine all the smaller rural areas, mm. the small villages where, you know, our hometown is. We're yeah. from a small village. Yeah, small and when village. I would go there to visit my grandma, we would five, six hours without power. Small and so I come home and I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking to myself, like, wow, we really are blessed. And then I tell my parents, I'm just like, man, like the blessings. And I took a nice hot shower all the, in, in, the entire time, just in awe of like, wow, like how different is life halfway across the globe? Yeah. And, and, and this is a luxury that is afforded to a person who makes bare minimum, like who makes the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. This is the luxury that is afforded them. And over there, this is a luxury that even the wealthy at times they can't even have it because if the power goes out, what are you going to do? If you, if you, okay, you may have a generator, but then even for that generator, it requires fuel. What yeah. happens when there's a fuel shortage, when there's a gas shortage over there? So uh -huh. everyone, no matter the amount of wealth that you have over there, you're always fighting for these things that we don't even think about over here that are what we consider like our basic needs. Yeah. And so I'm just sitting there and I'm taking it all in. And I was just like, we really need to be more appreciative of what we have over here. As Muslims, we just don't have this understanding. And having been removed from it for so long, it really, I felt like it made me appreciate those things so much more, just the finer things in life. And then I went for Salah and I met up with all of my friends. You know, it was just like one of those things where I, I we just picked up where we left off. Yeah, and they were sure. just like, hey man, what's going on? How was it? How was your journey and everything? And at that time, Mufti Minhaj, had, he had left the community mm -hmm. and he came back here to Chicago. He moved back here and um, we didn't have an imam at the time. And I remember after my first year of studying, they gave me a khutbah. They gave me the Jummah khutbah. Yeah. And I gave the Jummah khutbah and they're like, okay, we want you to do the Eid khutbah as well. Mm -hmm. And so I did the Eid khutbah as well. And in my mind, I was thinking, you know, when I saw that, that, and, and and all of my friends, they were they were sitting there, and they appreciated that. It made me feel, and and my parents were very supportive of that, and and they appreciated it as well. My grandma, she would travel back and forth. May Allah subhanahu wa taala mercy on her from I mean from uh, from Pakistan to to the states, and she came. And it, for her, it wasn't that easy to come to the masjid. And she was, I remember sitting there and just the entire time, you know, she was just crying. And it, just that appreciation that, okay, you know what? I'm doing something that is meaningful here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times my advice to my students and just anybody who's seeking knowledge is that a lot of times you're able to see the, the fruit of your labor. But a lot of times you're not able to see it as well. Mm-hmm. And when you're not able to see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's yeah. there. You may not find it where you, where you are currently, 
You, but you'll find it elsewhere. Guaranteed, you'll find it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Just keep doing what you're doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you. Sure. you know, but for me, I was blessed enough to see it so quickly. You know, maybe it was because if I hadn't seen it, maybe Allah knows best. Maybe my intentions would have changed. Allah, like, I'm doing all of this, but I don't see the fruit of my labor. Mm-hmm. So not seeing the fruit of your labor doesn't mean that you're not successful or what you're doing is the wrong thing. It's just that we need, sometimes we need to wait it out a little bit more. So for me, going back to Pakistan yeah. uh, to study, it wasn't a difficult move. Not that year, at least. Yeah, a couple of years later down <laughs> so the road, it was getting a little bit difficult. So when did it become difficult? It got difficult in my third year. Okay. And I was halfway through. Yeah. I was halfway through. I was going back for my third year. And I remember going back um and uh with one of my one of my friends, uh Mon Amer. He's uh he's in Indiana, he teaches over there as well with us, part of the board and everything, mashallah. And him and I, he was senior to me and uh, by a couple of years from Canada. Mm-hmm. And he came over Canada and he was transiting in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I came over from St. Louis and I was transiting in Chicago. And then our flight was together to Pakistan. Sure. And then I remember we were on the flight together and I was just, I don't know what was, it was just, I, I, it's not that I didn't want to study anymore per se, but it was just like, I didn't really feel like going back to Pakistan. Mm. It was hot. It was summertime, and then I was just dreading, you know, the the lack of power over there and electricity, <laughs> and all of that was just getting to me. And I was just like, man, I don't know if I'm ready for this just now. Yeah. And I was telling him the entire time, man, I don't know why, I don't know why, uh, you know, I I should have taken a little bit of a longer break or something. I should have asked for more of a break. And I remember landing in Lahore Airport and just telling him, man, I feel like getting on the next flight and just heading back. Oh wow. But that was only because. Of how uh, used to I had become of of the the, the blessings that we have here, no, the sure. basic needs that we necessities that we have here. I was just so used to that that I was like, man, because that was that year I was here for a longer period of time. Got it. Um, I took like an extended leave, an extended break, and because of that, I feel like maybe it just psyched me up a little bit mm-hmm. and uh, because of that i wasn't really able to focus so uh we we have eid al adha break which is almost like uh so ramadan finishes and then very soon after you know we would have our eid al adha break and i remember that year i actually came back to the states for mm-hmm. our eid al adha break even though it was only 10 days mm-hmm. oh, um, wow. and i didn't even tell my parents about it i just booked my ticket yeah and I remember talking to my dad. I was like, Dad, you know, what do you think if I came back, you know, during the break? Like, He's like, yeah, but uh, it'd be good. But, you know, like two days traveling here, two days there. That's like four days. And then you only have six days. And then, yeah. you know, you're going to tire yourself out. So, like, basically what you're saying is if I could get, a, like, a little bit more time, like 20 days or something like that, you think it would be worth it? He's like, yeah, <laughs> then I think it would be worth it. Yeah. And then I was like, okay. So then I went to my teacher, Sheikh Ramzi. I was like, look, you know, I really want to go home. Mm-hmm. And I want some extra time off. Like I want a, another week off. Yeah. And he's like, it's okay. You know, just go. Mashallah. Because we would only go once a year. Yeah. Whereas everybody else in Madrasa, they were from Pakistan. These guys would go home every break. And we would have at least three to four breaks throughout the year. You'd have the Eid al-Adha break. You have December break. And then after that, you know, they could go home if they wanted to for some, for the weekend or something like that. Mm-hmm. But we were there the entire year for like 10 months. And then we would go home once a year. And so Sheikh Ham's like, you more than deserve it. I was like, okay, I'm going to go. So I booked my ticket. I don't tell my parents. I don't tell anybody. I don't tell anybody. <laughs> All the way, I, I land in Chicago, then St. Louis. I grab a taxi. Oh, no way. From St. Louis. I go all the way home. I pay the taxi guy. And then I get out of the cab and I go to the front door. And I remember it's a Friday. Yeah. It was a Friday. And I rang the doorbell. And I see my dad. And we have this glass door. And I see my dad standing there at the at the basement stairs. Mm-hmm. And I know... the. The conversation that is happening there. He's asking my sister whether or not she ordered pizza. <laughs> because that could be the only logical explanation of somebody showing up Friday yeah. night ringing the doorbell. So I know he's asking. So he stops there. And then 
he obviously gets an answer, you know, that is not not in the affirmative. And yeah. he comes to the door and he opens it up and I stand off to the side. Like I'm kind of hiding off to the side. And then my dad comes and he looks outside and I'm like, surprise. And he's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you're here. How did you get here? And what's going on? Like he's like, I just spoke to you a couple of days ago and you were yeah. in Pakistan. Is everything okay? Yeah. Like yeah. he's like, how what happened? Why are you back? Mm. And then I gave him a big hug and everything. He was excited. And I was just like, yeah, dad. I was like, you know, you said if I could get 20 days, I could just come <laughs> home. I was like, I got 20 days and I'm going to be here. And I remember that it was October. And I came back and I spent that break here. And it was really good for me just to kind of recalibrate. Mm. And then after that, you know, spending more time at home. And then, you know, my mom was so excited too. She was like brushing her teeth at the time, getting ready for bed. And she was like, oh, you know, and my, my chachi was over as well. He's like, is everything What's okay? Wrong? You came back. I was like, <laughs> did you, did something happen? I was like, no, <laughs> nothing happened. I'm fine. I just wanted to give everybody a nice surprise. What's wrong? What's and, wrong? um. Then after, you know, spending 20 days here, there, the love have break here, I went back and then that's when I was like, okay, you know, I got this now, inshallah. And then inshallah. just push through it. Mashallah. And you were mentioning before too that you combined uh, your third and fourth year and your fifth and sixth. Correct. Year. Because the curriculum at the time for Hassanin was eight years. Okay. It was eight years. And the thing was that going back and forth so many times that was one issue the second issue was we were facing a lot of issues at like at the um like with customs with customs okay it was really annoying and yeah. every single time like we would sit down for like a good they would they would just have us they would have me wait for like a good 20 30 minutes just waiting and then the questioning wouldn't be it was the same questions every single time like five ten minutes of questioning and but and every time my answers were always the same they're like okay what do you do there i told him i'm studying this that what does your dad do what does your sister do okay yeah yeah yeah. just take that basic information okay all right you're good to go but every single time it was getting more and more difficult more and more difficult and then we get like these travel advisories it's better not to travel to pakistan it's better not mm. to travel to, for u.s citizens it's better not to travel to pakistan and also, our family is telling, telling us, like, you know, how much longer are you going to continue to go there? It's it's not easy to be gone for such a long period of time. And it was becoming difficult. And there were murmurs and conversations about them ultimately shortening the course to six years for everybody. Oh, wow. But that was still in the works. Now, it's six years. Mm. The Hassanin course is now six years. Mm -hmm. um, but back then, it was eight. So what I had, I, I obviously with the mushroom of my teachers and because Alhamdulillah I was doing well academically, they allowed for me to do this. Yeah, that inshallah. if this is the case, then you can combine third and fourth year. It doesn't mean that you're going to skip books. You still have to study for all the other books. You're going to get tested mm -hmm. on those books as well, but will allow you to combine the two classes. So I would like those books that were a little bit more difficult. I would sit in the and attend the classes for those. And those books that were more like geared towards like, let's say Arabic literature or something like that, that I could do self-study. Mm -hmm. Like for example, Surah Manhat Sahaba, a very common uh, book written by Rafat Ali Basha. Um, uh, Mufti Minhaj is one of the books that he really enjoys as well. And sure. it's something that we had currently have in our curriculum over there, here in Hassanin as well. So that was a book that and I remember Imam Bilal Ansari, he even told me, he's like, that's something that, that's like bedtime reading. You know, yeah. it's something that is very, but he's on that level to where, <laughs> to him, it's bedtime reading. <laughs> but for the common lay person, it might not be. So um, I remember that class was something I elected not to take, mm -hmm. but I still read all the material. And you still I got st tested on it. And I still, I still took the test. And sure. Alhamdulillah, uh, I, I did well. And then my, so third and fourth, I had combined. And then fifth and sixth, I had combined. And then seventh and eighth, I did separately. So seventh, I did separately. And then eighth, I did separately. My last two years of Dawr. Um, my my Dawratul Hadith. Okay. So my last two years of Dawratul Hadith, I did those separately. And um, in my in my seventh year, placed in the top five. Mashallah. And then in my eighth year as well, I also placed in the top five Mashallah. as well. In the, in the end. And the years before that, you were... First, right? In first and second, I was able to place. So I was first place Yeah. Um, in both of those years. And then oh. third and fourth, because I had combined, they couldn't really place me in a category. Mm -hmm. So they just, they didn't give me any ranking at all. I just mm -hmm. had like my test scores. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, they, sure. Alhamdulillah, they, uh, it was always. And then my <clears throat> seventh and eighth year, I was able to place. So those are placed in top five. Our seventh year, we had like 
70 students and then i think also in our eighth year we had the same number like 70 some odd students okay mashallah. so in hassanain you had two years of dora two years of hadith studies we did at the time correct now it's one year now it's one year yeah now it's so how was it walking into that those final two years of that curriculum we do mishkat um which is the year that they usually call Mokuf Ali, and that's right before Dawatul Hadith. Um, it's a hadith, it's yeah. a compilation of a hadith. So we did cover that book with Mufti Ahmad Ali, uh, who teaches over there. He's one of the senior teachers over there. We did that. So we did have an introduction to hadith. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you go into your final years, it's just so much hadith that there's a lot of material to cover. Yeah. That's the first thing. And the second thing is just you're so heavily focused on the hadith, the subject of hadith, because that's all you're doing. It's just a very spiritual last two years. Mashallah. And our teachers would always tell us that these two years, you need to be living them with the Prophet ﷺ. Because from morning till evening, all we're hearing is, that's what you're hearing the entire day. And it has a spiritual effect on you, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. So many of our classmates, many of them, they were able to see the Prophet in their dreams <laughs> from <laughs> what they, they told me. Um, and it's because of that. And, and Sheikh Ramzi, he told us this as well. Every time we say, that قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبالسند المتصل منا وبالسند المتصل منا when we say that that means the, and, and with the chain of narration that connects us to the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or to the imam to the imam who is narrating the book so for example imam bukhari rahimullah i have my teacher who has his teacher who has his teacher who has his teacher whose teacher was imam bukhari who narrates from 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 the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sorry, sorry. So that every time you say that, minna, you're flipping the switch that causes that electricity to run from you all the way to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So to sit with that mentality each and every single time we sit in class, it was very, very different. Because in fiqh, a lot of times, and this is what Muhammad Tariq Jamil Sahib mentioned as well, in fiqh, it's a lot of debate, mm -hmm. right? You learn... You're just debating constantly. Imam Shafi'i says this. Imam Abu Hanifa says this. Imam Malik says this. Imam Muhammad Hanbal says this. And all of these opinions and then their proofs and this and that. And you become very argumentative. And with hadith, all of that falls to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And you're just solely focused on what the Prophet <clears throat> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying. Sorry, sorry. And so to just like envision yourself being there with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it really is like a culmination of everything that we've studied. Because our fiqh is bu built off of hadith. Yeah. Tafsir. The, the tafsir of the Quran is hadith as well. There mm -hmm. are many a hadith that in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does tafsir of the Quran. So you, and, you, and you're covering the seed of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So hadith is a culmination of everything that you've studied. Mm -hmm. Everything. From all the way from wudu, all the way till like talaq. Sure. Everything. Sure. It's all covered right there in hadith. And it's just a culmination of that. And they just envision that you are one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Sitting there, sure. listening to him saying those words. That is what really, that's why hadith, it's towards the end to kind of give you that, okay, now you are, quote unquote like a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now this is the final step that mm -hmm. suhbah so that the purpose is even though we can't have that physical suhbah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to at least have the spiritual suhbah that spiritual companionship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's what we strive for in the last in the in, in Dawatul Hadith whether it's one year or two years Mashallah. You mentioned a lot of your teachers' names. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on some of them and like the, the effects that they've had on you um, as a student and now a teacher yourself? Uh, Maltar Jamil, right? He uh, is so uh, popular now. Everybody knows him. Um, and the he taught us our final two years. Mashallah. He taught us hadith. Um, not on a daily basis, but as often as he could, given his busy schedule. He's always traveling at that time. And one thing that he would always say, and that's why you, you still hear him saying the same thing today. 
اچھے اخلاق اچھے اخلاق گڈ کیریکٹر گڈ کیریکٹر دیٹس واٹ میٹرس گائز دیٹس واٹ میٹرس اینڈ دیٹس دا پوائنٹ دیٹ ہی ووڈ ٹرائی اینڈ ڈرائیو ہوم آل دا ٹائم all of this knowledge it won't benefit you in the least if you don't have good character if you don't have good character and then he would tell us the hadith that all of the amal are on one side and if you put al khuluq al hasan on one side of the scale that'll weigh heavier than everything else yeah and that's the point that he drove home to us all the time from every facet of life mashallah whether it's you being a son whether it's you being a husband you being a father you being a brother a cousin an uncle a merchant a doctor whatever field you choose to be in in life make sure that it's accompanied with good character and i know that it's a cliche and we hear him saying it all the time but that's how much he talks about it sure. every single day every dars he just had to find a way to tie it back to good character sure. he had to find a way to tie it back and that's why people they say like when they meet him they don't feel like he's this big time og scholar yeah you know, they feel like he's a normal individual yeah i mean he's got his entourage and everything that we see from the cameras now but if you sit down with him one on one he's really down to earth Mashallah. and he focuses on you gives you time he love and respect he'll call you beta and he'll yeah, he'll really listen to what you have to say inshallah that's one of the main things that we learn from mohtar ismail sahab And then from our our teacher, um, you've probably heard about him. He's my teacher. He's Mullah Bilal's teacher, Mufti Azim's teacher, Sheikh Ramzi Al Habib. Inshallah. Sheikh Ramzi Al Habib at Tunisi. His story is just crazy. He came to Pakistan at the age of 16 years old from Tunisia, Mashallah. not knowing what to expect. He had spent time in the path of in Tabliq in yeah. Tunisia. He told his parents, "I'm going Allah. to Pakistan," and his dad was so. enraged he was like what do you mean like you're leaving all of this behind where are you why would you go there yeah like pakistan of all places you're gonna go to the hajam to learn <laughs> the deen like you're gonna go to non-arabs to learn the deen like what are you doing yeah. and his mother may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her she said mm-hmm. don't worry about it you go i'll take care of your dad and sheikh ramzi set out and he set out at the age of 16 he goes to pakistan He memorizes the Quran, then he goes on to do an alim course. He places number one in like all of Pakistan, you Asha. know. And his, and then after that, he spent one year in Tabligh as well. And then he came to Hassanain, and he spent time in Hassanain, and he taught. He was in, he was actually in Faisalabad in Jamaat. Mm-hmm. And as he's in Jamaat, he. comes and he, someone tells him about this madrasa montar to mills house mother so you should go check it out students speak arabic over there and so sheikh hamzi went over he was impressed he's like yo your arabic environment this is different and yeah. he gave like a few lectures and the students really they had a connection with sheikh hamzi sheikh hamzi had a connection with them and they really you know like there was this mutual uh, bonding between them and sheikh hamzi like i want to stay here a little bit longer he ended up staying a month Two Ashram. months, three months. Then, you know, we kind of got him for an entire year. And then Sheikh Ramzi ended up staying there for a number of years. So he didn't go home until he was in his 30s. Oh, no way. Subhanallah. Not a single time from 16. For 15 years, Sheikh Ramzi didn't go home. Allah. For 15 years. That's and then, nuts. Yeah, give or take. Yeah, give yeah. or take. But it was at least 15 years from what I remember, if I remember correctly. And then he goes home to, to Tunisia to get married. Subhanallah. And he gets right. married and he brings his wife to to Pakistan as well. And he's still there. Now he's Sheikh Al-Hadith there. Mashallah. And he teaches Bukhari there. Mashallah. And you can see it, the amount of respect that Sheikh Ramzi gets. Mashallah. The amount of love that he gets. And the amount of care that he has for the, his students. Mashallah. He, in the in, in in the middle of the night, his house is inside the madrasa, attached to the madrasa. And at one o'clock, two o'clock in the night, he'd just be walking around checking on the students. is making sure that there is is there somebody that needs my help hmm. is there somebody out there that you know he he may be sad or hurt or something like that and he needs somebody to talk to this is the sheikh al hadith walking around doing that Allah. so humble and he would play soccer with us after asr oh mashallah yeah and and mashallah he would be one with the students and you would really mashallah. feel it he would go swimming with us mashallah and 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 from him i learned how to be a friend mashallah. with your students and not to and in the class yeah you have that 
persona of being a teacher. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you need to be this uber big time sheikh where you're unapproachable and your students always have to be in awe of you and they can't approach you and they mm -hmm. can't have a one-on-one -on -one conver an open heart conversation. They can't. Mm. Right? That's what I took from Sheikh Ramzi. And then we have Mu'al Baidullah. Mu'al Baidullah, he's also a Sheikh al-Hadith there. He teaches Bukhari. And anyone who you ask, he is just the softest person you've ever met in your life. Mashallah. Just so soft. And when he speaks, his speech is sweeter than honey. Mashallah. Never will you ever hear him raise his voice. Mashallah. And you know how with Umar radiallahu it was said that he was so loud. But when the ayat came down, when the verses came down, uh, Do not raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet He would whisper to a point where the Prophet would have to lean in and kind of listen to what Umar radiallahu was saying. It was, and that's how careful Umar radiallahu was. We would always have to lean in and listen to what Muhammad al-Sahab was saying. Mashallah. Because it was just, he was so soft-spoken. Not Mashallah. because he was weak or feeble, not because of that. Yeah. But because he was just so soft-spoken. Mashallah. So soft-spoken. Wouldn't raise, won't get angry, mashallah. Very rarely would we see him get, very rarely. Like, he's true, like, there, there are those individuals who, who don't get upset. But they're mm -hmm. still animated. Like yeah. even myself, like I'm animated right now. I'm I I I'm kind of loud, but he he didn't have that. He wasn't animated. He wasn't loud. Just very quiet. Not because he was feeling weak or anything like that, but that's just that was his temperament. Mashallah. And from him, like you take that, you take how how to be soft and caring like a mother. Mashallah. Mashallah. And then Mufti Ahmad Ali, you had Mufti Ahmad Ali. He was the Head Mufti of the Madrasa, he still teaches there. And from him, we learned the art of debate. From him, we learned what it means to truly be knowledgeable. He teaches Hidayah, okay, which is an advanced fiqh book. And it's every dars in his army, every every madrasa has to have hidayah. It's it's a book that you have to study. You know, if you tell somebody that you haven't studied hidayah in a, in a madrasa, they're going to be like, well, what did you study? That is our fiqh. How did you not study that? And it's, you have an ibadah, you have text, and then underneath that, you have explanation of that text. And then you have like, okay, Imam Abu Hanifa says this, his two students say this, Imam Shafi says this. The proofs of Imam Abu Hanifa, this is Imam Abu Hanifa's proof, this is Imam Shafi's proof. Okay. And then this is what the author, the author says, was sahihu, and the correct goal is sometimes he'll allude to that, sometimes he won't. Mufti Ahmad Ali didn't need a book to teach. I sure. tell you this without any exaggeration. Like there are legends that we hear about, like you hear about individuals that, like Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, for X number of years, he prayed Fajr with wudu of Isha, right? We hear something like that. But this is something that we saw with our own eyes. He would literally, he, he taught us the third volume of Hidayah. He would literally come to class, sit down, and he'd just say, read, read from the book. And he wouldn't ask for a book to be put on uh, on his desk. He would just sit there, cross his arms, and then you just, the guy would read. Okay. In this masala, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, his opinion is this. In this, Imam Muhammad says this. Imam Abu Yusuf says this. Imam Shafi says this. Imam Abu Hanifa, this is his proof. Imam Abu Yusuf, this is his proof. This is what Imam Muhammad says. This is what Imam Shafi says. And the Muftabihi opinion is this because this, this, this. And he had the ability to take the most complicated part of the book, the most complicated text, and make it the easiest part of the entire book. Mashallah. He just had that innate ability to teach. That's what we took from him. That's so nice. each Ustad, they had their own flavor that they kind of put into that dish, mm -hmm. which is the student of knowledge, right? And it's just our job to to take from them as much as we possibly can. Mashallah, mashallah. And how was your... And, the, and these, mind you, these are just some of the teachers, right? These are just some of the teachers, the more senior teachers. So many other teachers that have different things to offer. Mu'a Zubair, he also taught us Sahih Muslim. Mu'a Arif, he taught us Jamat Tirmidhi. The memorization power that that individual has, you know, I probably haven't seen anything like that. And Mu'a Shahid Jawaid and Mu'a Habib, all of the teachers that I have failed to mention, 
and just because for the sake of brevity, you know, we just can't go over all of them and all the qualities that they bring to the table. But each one, they eat, they bring their own flavor. And that's Inshallah. kind of the beauty of what we see in the Sahaba radiallahu as well. The Sahaba, how each one took like a different trait from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's beautiful, mashallah. Um, how was it leading up to your graduation? So for me, towards the end, uh, the, the madrasa in Indianapolis was already established mm -hmm. over here. Um, my my friend that I mentioned earlier, Mal Namir, he had came here a couple of years prior to that. I graduated in 2016, so he came here in 2013 or so. Oh, and sure. him and uh, a couple of other brothers, uh, Mal Suleiman, who's now currently in Ohio, uh, Mufti Suleiman, he was here before. He had started it with the, Dr. Bilal. They had started it together there. And then Mal Namir came on board. And Sheikh Ramzi was uh, very involved uh, in in guiding them and telling them, okay, this is the curriculum. This is what you guys need to do, and those initial steps. So, and and Muatar Jamil Sahab as well was was aware of what was going on and how there's a madrasa that kind of has the same curriculum as we do over here in America, and you know they're teaching kids Arabic and how to speak Arabic and that sort of thing. And instead of the kids having to come all the way over here, they could just study over over there in their yeah. backyards, right? They don't have to go far. And we can teach them the true message of Islam and character and love and peace and all of that stuff right there. And so at the time, they only had three teachers. So they were short-staffed. Mm -hmm. So my final year, Sheikh Ramzi had kind of alluded to the fact that he, he wanted me to go there. And yeah. he wanted me to teach there. So in my mind, I already had that set that I was going to go there. And I was going to go to Indianapolis and I was going to teach. And then I discussed it with my parents as well. And, you know, it only being three and a half, four hours away from home. They're like, you know, maybe that's a good thing for you to kind of get out of the community a little bit and mm -hmm. away from home and kind of make your own niche. And then after that, maybe somewhere down the road, come back or something like that. You know, just try and test the water, see what's out there. Yeah, It's good to, it's good for your growth. It'll give you good exposure. You're going into something, a, a, a well, uh, you know, a fine oiled machine. Mm -hmm. So that's what I had in my mind. And prior to graduation, the reality started to set in that I was going to leave this place that I had called home for the last six years. Mm -hmm. And now I was going to quote unquote go out into the real world where I wouldn't have the love and tutelage of my teachers. And I wouldn't have this safe haven to fall back onto if I had any issues, these teachers that I can rely on and, and kind of go to and have a shoulder to lean on when I need one, that wouldn't be there anymore. That was, it was always a bittersweet moment because at the same time, I was like, well, if now I finally get to go home and I get to be closer to my parents. Instead of seeing them once a year, I can see them once a month now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just make the drive down to St. Louis. Um, but at the same time, I was like, man, I want to study some more. So my conundrum was I wanted to study more. I wanted to do the hustles. Yeah. And I remember having a sit down with Mohan Bilal and Mohan Hamza, and they were telling me, like, you know, you got to go study some more. And then I told Sheikh Hamza, I was like, I want to go study some more. I'm not done studying. Yeah. I want to do two more. I want to do the hustles either in hadith, a specialization in hadith or a specialization in fiqh. Mm -hmm. I want to study more. And I remember Sheikh Ramzi said, your specialization is going to be teaching. Mashallah. You will teach and through that you'll, you'll gain specialization. That's what he told me at the time. Um, not to say that like, I regret following his advice or anything like that. He's my ustad and he gave me advice and I followed that advice and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Um, I was able to come here and I was able to benefit from Mufti Abrar for about two years. Um, after from from 2018 to 2020, basically, um, I Mufti Bari gave me permission to participate in the classes. Yeah, so sure. I would commute one week. I would be here in Elgin. And I would attend the classes there, and then one week I would attend online. And then obviously with the pandemic and everything, then we just went online completely. Yeah. Um, but I was able to participate in the classes, and I really benefited a lot. I mean, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless him. I mean, you had him here on the yeah. on the podcast as well. Amazing individual. I love Mashallah. him to death. And 
you know, if if I had gone and done tahassus, I wouldn't have been able to build that taluk with Mufti Abar. And I really, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I I, I really do. Um, with Mufti Abar, I feel like I have a special taluk Mashallah. there with him, and um, that wouldn't have happened had I not followed the advice of my ustad. Absolutely. So. A lot of times I feel like in the moment we may not know what's good for us, whereas somebody who's older and more wise, they have a more broad picture of the world. Mm -hmm. Whereas us, a lot of times we just have tunnel vision yeah. and we're just like, we become so focused on a singular aspect. Sure, that may have been beneficial for my own personal gain, me going and studying for two more additional years, I would have benefited a lot from that personally. But the relationships that I built in those two years that I was teaching, I wouldn't trade those for anything. Mashallah. In those two years of teaching, 2016 to 2017 and 2017 to 2018, those students and the, those relationships that I built, you know, money and all the money in the world can't buy that. Mashallah. And it's all thanks to, you know, just listening to your teachers, being obedient, listening to your parents. And it was that trust that allowed me to make that transition sure. from alim course into teaching and into being an imam and into giving khutbas and doing all that sort of, that transition was made easy because my ustad had faith in me mm -hmm. and he said no you can do this this is something that you definitely can do so i remember in on my graduation i can't remember the exact date um i can't remember the exact date and I, I, the the hadith, however, I finished the, uh, the my final hadith in Bukhari in April of 2016. Oh. I think it was April 6th. Um, it's the same day as my brother-in-law's birthday. He's, if he sees this, he's gonna get upset. He's like, how how could you forget? <laughs> but uh, I have it written in my copy of Bukhari at home, and we finished. And then shortly thereafter, in May, we had our graduation ceremony. I think, or it was, I think it was April that we had it. And I remember that. Um, yeah, I told everybody back here about me graduating and everything. And um, one of the things that um, I was, I it kind of it hit me and it made me feel the same way I felt when I had started the journey. Mm -hmm. In the last part of the podcast, I had mentioned that when my uncle, he dropped me off and I truly felt alone. Yeah. Like I didn't have anybody. It was that same uncle that showed up on my graduation day. Allah. Just him. Mashallah. And I still felt alone because I was like, you know, my family's not here with yeah. me to celebrate this moment. And it wasn't like streamed online or anything like the Zoom and all that <laughs> stuff. We weren't really Zoom savvy back then. <laughs> yeah. So no one from my family was really able to participate. But at the same time, you know, I didn't really tell anybody to come either. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to inconvenience my dad, you know, with his work and everything. And then my mom, I don't know if this, how the setup was going to be and everything. So I was like, whatever, you know, it is what it is. I'll just, you know, my uncle that was there who dropped me off is is the same uncle that was there towards the end kind of thing. And it was just funny how that comes full circle. I never actually thought about that up until now that that same uncle that dropped me off in the beginning, he was the same one that was there all the way towards the end. Um you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. Yeah. And but in my heart, I didn't feel any like anything bad towards my family for not showing up or anything. Yeah. I understood, you know, that so far away and everything, it's not it's not easy, obviously, just picking up the entire family and going for like one event or two uh, for that's just gonna last span over a few hours. And the other issue was that we weren't one hundred percent sure when it was actually going to happen either. Mm. So I mean, because it is kind of like Pakistan. So they didn't really have the luxury of like over here. It's like, okay, you know, when your child's graduation is going to happen the day they enter high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get my vacation for that time as well. Yeah. Now in Pakistan, it's like, okay, you know, maybe it's next week. Maybe it's the week after <laughs> and tickets are like $3,000 or something. So it's well within the realm of understanding that, you know, it's, it's fine. Yeah. It wasn't that big a deal, but it just, it, it, it truly made me feel that, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is there at all times, whether we realize it or not. In the beginning, in that moment when I was alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there, same time at the end. So it gives you that ability to kind of realize that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there. Mm -hmm. And don't let the number of people around you distract you from that fact, whether they're there, whether they're not there. When you get back to the States, mashallah, you start teaching at the mother son Indianapolis. Correct. 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 So can you share with us a little bit about what Hassanain is or Hosnain? Hassanain. Hassanain. So it is Hassanain. Um, Do you guys go through name changes? No, no, we didn't go through name changes. It's just Al Husnain. Yeah. It's written that way just for the sake of ease. Mm. Because writing Hassanain, like on legal documents and stuff like that, and spelling it out to individuals, it gets a little bit tough. Yeah. So Al Husnain is like a little bit easier okay. in that regard. So that's why it was. That that name was chosen, the spelling was chosen rather. Correct. But it is the correct pronunciation is Al Hassanain, okay, just like sure. the seminary that I studied from in Pakistan, Jamiat Al Hassanain. Uh -huh. Same exact thing. Muhtar Jamil Sahib's vision of having an Arabic medium school, mm -hmm. the same thing. And uh, you know, when I went there, I taught. I taught uh, all the years. I taught first, second, third, and fourth. Mashallah. Um. So I was in first year. I was teaching, uh, sarf morphology along with al qiraat al-Rashida. Second year, I was also teaching some Arabic literature. Third year, I was teaching that book that I spoke about earlier, Surah Manhat Sahaba, yeah, sure. that literature book. And then in fourth year, I was teaching Balagha, along with a little bit of Aqidah. So um, I was really uh, into I dove straight into it, um, head first. And Alhamdulillah, I never felt like it was too difficult. Of course, it did require a lot of effort requires studying because when you want to teach you have to do lesson planning obviously mm -hmm. and you need to make sure that i'm equipped with the answers that the students may ask me tomorrow Correct. so you really need to know what you're teaching and you need to know the translation of the text and you need to know the understanding of the text you need to know it backwards and forwards mm -hmm. um so that really gave me another perspective because when you're when you're studying a book from the perspective of a student a lot of times you're reading something and you're like, okay, I don't get this. Let me look at the commentary. Then you look down towards the commentary and the commentary may say something about it, may not say something about it. Okay, maybe you still don't understand it. You've understood about 80%, 90%. And mm -hmm. then you say, okay, the rest of the 10%, I'm going to leave on the Ustad. The Ustad will come in tomorrow and he'll explain the rest of the 10% to me. As a teacher, you don't have that luxury of, Okay, I'll figure out the rest of the 10% later. <laughs> you are that 10%. Mashallah. So it requires you getting outside of that book, not just relying upon the... Con you have to go outside and you have to look at other supplementary books. You have to look at books that are commentaries on that particular book. Maybe look and see in another uh, fiqh book what the opinion is on this particular matter. Maybe even call up some of your teachers and ask them, I don't understand this. I need to understand this. A lot of that may happen in order for you to prepare yourself to teach your students tomorrow morning. So that really taught me a lot in, in, in that year and in the subsequent year. The next year, you know, always trying to take on different subjects. And it's come to a point where, so that was 2016, 2017. 2017 to 2018 took on, you know, different subjects. A little bit, fiqh. My, the first year of teaching was uh mainly geared towards Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second year, a little bit of Arabic and I kept a little bit more, of, I wanted to do more fiqh. I wanted to get more into fiqh. And because of that, that led me to uh, reaching out and trying to broaden my horizon in regards to fiqh. Mashallah. And so I reached out to Mufti Bar and I said, I wanted to attend his classes. I couldn't write the fatawa. I couldn't do the tamarin, mm -hmm. which is what we call the tamarin, the writing of the fatawa, the number of fatawa that you ever, but he gave me permission to participate in the classes. And so that gave me a little bit more of an understanding, being able to sit and have those conversations, Mashallah. those fiqh debates and everything in, in the modern context over here in America. Because the way that we learn in Pakistan is different from the way that we learn over here, which is another reason why it's very important that we have individual scholars that are well-versed in the ways of the world here in America that can then take that knowledge, put the two together, and be able to give it to you in a way that, hey, these are our classic uh, fic works. Mm -hmm. This is our knowledge, and this is how it's applicable today. This is where we see its application today. That's very important. That's something I feel like maybe I, I, I gained from, from those sessions, from those classes. And then ultimately being able to impart that to my students. Um, where after that, then I took on 
teaching the second volume of Hidayah, Mashallah. which is predominantly about nikah, mm-hmm. marriage, divorce, laws. That's what I what I teach. I've been teaching that for almost four years now. Mashallah. Um, and then I took on the fourth volume of Hidayah, which has a lot to deal with um, halal, halal, uh, halal haram ingredients, um, like alcohol and uh, just a whole array of topics, something that we call shufa in, in, the, in the Arabic language, which is preemption. Um, and, and that's a very, very complex concept, right? So shufa is a very con- complex concept. Mm-hmm. It's hard to grasp our minds, right? Like over here in America, <clears throat> we may not even know what preemption is. What is preemption? Yeah. And you have your right to first offer and you have your right to first r- 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 refusal. And you have these different terms that we use in the housing market. Yeah. And those things are mentioned in our book. So to be able to tell the student that these things that you're studying here, they are applicable here in America as well. So I've mm-hmm. been teaching the fourth volume of Hidayah. Um, for for almost this is going to be my inshallah I think third or fourth year teaching third year mashallah. teaching that and I've been teaching Quduri which is the basic fiqh manual of the Hanafi madhab mashallah. for almost three years now as well and I still try to keep an Arabic class just so I keep it fresh so I don't forget all of my Arabic <laughs> um, and actually this year I, I, I took on an Arabic class after maybe a year or two of not teaching Arabic mm-hmm. and you know so there were some instances where I, I I hesitated for a brief moment, like, oh, I can't remember this word. Okay, there it is. Yeah. And so that kind of scared me, like, okay, I need to keep up with it. And I need to also make sure that I'm teaching some sort of Arabic class to keep the to keep the information fresh. But we have a six-year course there now, alhamdulillah. And, you know, we're we're doing, Dar al Salaam is doing great work. Dar al Qasim is doing great work. Um, these madaris that we see, these seminaries that we see doing such great work, we're just trying to replicate the same thing. We're, we're not rivals or anything. It's all one fraternity. Mashallah. So the goal is to impart that Islamic knowledge the way that it's supposed to be taught mm-hmm. and the way that it's supposed to be understood to individuals who will then take this knowledge and become the leaders of tomorrow here in America and be able to access a crowd that we were once a part of. Mashallah. Like we were those young individuals looking for some type of knowledgeable individual to connect to, yeah. to be able to explain to us the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we, in, at, at our time, alhamdulillah, we had somebody like Mufti Muhaj, but not every community is like that. Mashallah. Not every community is like Chicago, where you have the luxury of having two to three scholars per masjid. Mashallah. You have smaller communities that are begging, that are begging for scholars, that are born and raised here, People that understand the youth here and are able to connect with them mm-hmm. and that are able to explain Islam to their children in a manner that their children understand it. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we didn't have. And so all of these different uh, madaris and seminaries that we, we see, they're all working towards that. And each mm-hmm. one is khayr. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we're doing in, 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 in Hassanain. Our approach is a little bit different. <laughs> Then some other madaris with the stress uh, on Arabic and um, making sure that a child is able to converse in the Arabic language because our philosophy is that if you're able to speak the language, then you'll be able to understand it better. Yeah. And you'll be able to understand the Quran better. You'll be able to understand the Hadith better than if you just understand the, you understand it, but you can't really speak it. It strengthens an individual's uh, language when they're able to speak it and when they're able to understand it so um alhamdulillah that's that's what we're aiming for and now we have almost 10 uh full-time teachers Mashallah. that teach uh the alim course Mashallah. two hifs teachers and then we also have two staff for the, we have a, a cook and then a, a cook's assistant as well Mashallah. so alhamdulillah we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing the 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 madrasa, the seminary to grow. We have around 80, 85 students now, including Hibs and full-time Anam course. Mashallah. The dormitory and everything there. And alhamdulillah, we're working on trying to expand, inshallah. It's something that we ask everybody to make dua for. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts what we're doing and Ameen. allows it to, to grow and flourish with khair. Ameen. Inshallah. Ameen. So 
as somebody who's mashallah <laughs> studied overseas and has now been teaching for the last five years or so at a sister madrasa yeah. uh, from the one in Pakistan, would you advise anyone to go and travel overseas to study? That's a tough. Uh, that's a tough question because for me myself, like I went and I studied overseas. If I would tell anybody not to go overseas, it would be for the reason of just not being able to survive in that environment and just things being a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, just the quality of life and how if they were to do that, that may become a hindrance in them trying to ultimately study and maybe they won't be able to do it. And honestly, now here in America, we have individuals that have gone overseas and studied and they're very, very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. So even if they were to stay here and study anywhere here, I don't think they'd be selling themselves short. So mm -hmm. it really is about personal preference. And I think what it really boils down to is whether or not you're able to be able to um, deal with the elements over there. Yeah, That's the main thing. For sure. Otherwise, when it comes to knowledge itself i feel like over here we have a lot to offer alhamdulillah but definitely if one is able to get like the best of both worlds kind of thing maybe do a little bit familiarize themselves once they get in the environment over here learn what it means to be a student of knowledge become familiar with the subjects a year or two here and then maybe go overseas maybe that's something that is probably better but again each person is different and there's no one general piece of advice that I could give. Everybody's yeah. situation is different. Yeah, now, sure. 10 years ago, had I had the same opportunity to study here versus going overseas, I probably would have ended up staying here because my parents probably would have wanted me to stay here. Yeah. But at that time, we didn't have Dar es Salaam, Hassanain. We didn't have yeah, we true, all, didn't, sure. didn't have any of these institutes except for maybe, uh, except for Elgin. Yeah. And at that time, I wasn't even too familiar with Elgin. I didn't even know much about Elgin. I just mm -hmm. thought it was a Hivs Madrasa. Yeah. And all you can do there is if I didn't even know that they had Alam course until I studied a year or two after that. And I found out that Mufti Asif Omar, yeah, I'm I'm sure he studied from there. <laughs> and I was like, you did HIF there. And he's like, no, no, I did my Alam course there as well. I was like, oh, I didn't even know that you could do that. Yeah, mashallah. Mashallah. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> because everybody always speaks about the HIF mother side. Yeah, yeah. And I just didn't really know too much about about the yeah. course program there. Oh, mashallah. What advices would you give to people who are looking to memorize Quran? To people that are looking to memorize Quran, one is that like, no, you're never too old to memorize the Quran. Mm. You need to know that. Know that you're never too old to memorize the Quran. There's no age limit where a person says like, you're too old to memorize the Quran. Yeah. You can always memorize the Quran. Shana. Understand that the Sahaba, when they memorized the Quran in their entirety, many of them were over the age of 40, 50. MashaAllah. Um, of course, then one could object to that and say, well, they were the Sahaba and their ability to retain and, and they was their native tongue. And a lot, all of that is true. But we have many examples, many examples of individuals memorizing the Quran after high school. Yeah. In, after college even. MashaAllah. Um, and I think I spoke about this in the last episode as well. We had somebody who memorized the Quran while doing an autumn course. Oh, Shana. He finished up his eight years. And along with that, he memorized the Quran as well. He remember, he finished memorizing the Quran, I think, in his sixth or seventh year. Mashallah. Every day he would sit down between Asr and Maghrib and he would memorize the Quran. Beautiful. We just need to maximize our time, really. Yeah. People say, no, I can't do it or it's too difficult. I mean, if we <sighs> cut out all the other stuff that is not really conducive to our time, then we'll be able to memorize the Quran. Now imagine, you know, I mean, I've never watched it, but so many people have told me about the whole, uh, the series, the what, resurrection of, what is it called? The one on Netflix, the earth roll or? Turkish thing? The Turkish, yeah. That, that, yeah, yeah. So one of those episodes, somebody was telling me is like <clears throat> 60 minutes or something like that. And there are like I think I there's think 30 like, or 40 episodes per season. There's like a couple hundred or something episodes. Allah knows best. But yeah. like even if one episode, just assume that one episode is 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And you have even 10 episodes per season. That's a lot of time. 
Yeah. That is a lot of time that you're spending <laughs> watching something. Now, imagine instead of watching that, you can memorize Quran. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to do this, but the only reason why I'm mentioning this is that individual who has an ambition to memorize the Quran, know that it's well within your ability to do it. You just have to cut out on all these other things. All of these people that are extremely successful in the world, you have all of these billionaires, look at their schedules. They'll be working 12 hours a day and with little to no sleep because they know that time is money. I need to maximize the time that I have. If I'm sitting down, I'm watching a show or watching a YouTube video that isn't increasing my knowledge or isn't benefiting my business, then I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. So if our goal is to memorize the Quran, but we're complaining because we don't have time, then it's probably better to just take a step back and look at what we're actually doing and see like, do I really need to watch this show? Do I really need to watch uh, these episodes? Or do yeah. I really need to watch this YouTube video at this time? Instead of that, even if you take out in 60 minutes a day, if you're watching an episode, let's say even once a week, once a week, you take out 60 minutes to memorize the Quran. That's at least two pages of Quran right there. Yeah. And two pages on the week, there are 20 pages in one subar, one juz. Mm -hmm. So if you do two pages every week consistently, on the month, that gives you how much? On the month, that gives you eight pages. And in the span of almost two months, you'll have 16 pages memorized. Add one more month to that, add a half month to that. So in two and a half months, you'll have one juz done. Yeah, sure. If you just spend 60 minutes once a week. <clears throat> and if you can't do 60 minutes once a week, then you split it out over the week. Yeah. 10 minutes every day. That's 70 minutes in a week, right? So it's all just about time management, really. Yeah. That's really what it boils down to. It's all For about sure. time management. If we manage our time correctly, we can achieve those goals that we set for ourselves. Inshallah, inshallah. And what advices would you have for somebody who's studying deen or looking uh, to go study? One thing is don't uh, ever shy away from that. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you know, maybe I should uh, do something else or you know, maybe this isn't right for me or maybe I'm not worthy. That mentality, that's from the shaitan. Mm -hmm. For an individual to, for someone to think I'm not worthy of studying this, this, uh, this knowledge. We all learn so that we can improve. We yeah. all learn so that we can improve. When you start your journey, when Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, started studying, he wasn't Imam Abu Hanifa. It took him time to get there. Imagine if he gave up somewhere in between. He never would have reached where he was. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, when you have that ambition and that goal, don't step back from that thinking that you're not worthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put that in your mind for a reason. And no matter the circumstances, whatever happens in life, with the way things are now, there's always some way that we can learn in some capacity, no matter what age we are, mm -hmm. no matter what age we are. There are courses that are offered in the summer. There are courses like Mifta Institute, you know, yeah, really, good, really good friends of mine, all, all the Wahid brothers, mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. I mean, what they're doing for professionals be to be able to study online on that platform. It's, it's a good thing. You know, that's something that is available. That's something that you can definitely do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made means for us to seek that knowledge. Never say that you're not worthy of it. Always try to learn as much as you possibly can and implement as much as you possibly can because we don't know what we learn that will change our lives. Yeah. So always just stick with it and know that there is some way for you to learn. Absolutely. There is some way for you to learn, regardless of what, what age you are, where you are in life. There's always some way for you to learn, inshallah. inshallah. Especially with the technology that we have today and the facilities that we have today. It's very, very accessible. Inshallah, man. Jazakallahu khairan, Mona, for coming out here uh, and continuing. And after I bothered you a few times, a couple of reschedules. No, no, no problem. Inshallah, <laughs> just make dua for me. Inshallah, make inshallah. dua for, for my family. And ultimately, as uh, Muslims, we just make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He... Uh, takes us from this world in a state of Iman. I mean, pass away I mean. in Iman and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers us all in Firdaus. I mean, I mean, I mean, Jazakallah khairan. And again, if anyone wants or is interested in Mother Sir Hassanain, uh, they're located in Indianapolis. The link is down below. MashaAllah, they have a very unique curriculum uh, that has a focus on Arabic. 
Uh, and they also have an integrated curriculum with uh, college where you leave with your Adamiya degree and an undergraduate degree as well. MashaAllah, something that is much needed. Jazakallah khair. And again, Mona, uh, for coming on. May Allah Ta'ala reward you and bless you, reward your teachers, uh, elevate the status of your grandmother who put so much effort into you, mashallah. May Allah forgive her sins and grant her a window of Jannah and grant her for those that Ada be ghairi hisab. Jazakallah khair. And again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you.